And welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Advances in Subcellular and Cellular in Vivo Imaging for Systems Biology. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and it is my pleasure to be your host for today's event. Our session is brought to us by Syntica Instrumentation and will focus on current trends and technological advancements in the field of in vivo fluorescence imaging with a focus on new applications and capabilities as realized by confocal fluorescence endomicroscopy and 3D automated optional sectioning. Uh, the presentation will be led by Peter Delaney, Chief Technology Officer at OptiScan. Mr. Delaney completed a science degree with honors in pharmacology at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia in 1989 and immediately following entered into commercial development of miniaturized imaging technology. He has played a major role in the refinement of fiber optic approach for microscopic imaging in the life sciences, to which he received an R&D 100 award in 1991. In 1993, Mr. Delaney received the Victorian Young Achiever Award in Science and Technology for his development of OptiScan company structure, uh, strategy and infrastructure. And in 2007 was awarded a prestigious ATSE Clunes Ross Award for excellence in the innovation and commercialization of scientific endeavors. His entire career has been dedicated to the advancements of miniaturized imaging technology for in vivo applications. Today, Mr. Delaney will discuss unique combinations of advanced imaging instrumentation, fluorescence probes, and key applications in terms of their capabilities, limitations, and possibilities. Discussion will center on the importance of cellular and subcellular observations in vivo, often producing results counter to in vitro cellular behavior and therefore streamlining research paths. In addition, he will share a variety of sample images demonstrating novel capabilities in the world of high resolution in vivo confocal imaging. Well, it's a, a delight to be here to discuss uh, a topic that's uh, very close to my, uh, my, my interest and passion for, for imaging technology and its development and furtherment. So thank you all for making the time to participate. I, re I really hope you find the uh, presentation educational, informative and interesting and I look forward to your um, interaction and, and feedback. By way of overview, what I'll be covering today is uh, in vivo microscopy and why it is of growing importance in systems biology. Um, I'll overview a, a selection of technologies and uh, then I'll use illustrative applications examples and in fact I'll use those throughout to uh, to demonstrate the differences between the technologies. Um, so why is in vivo microscopy so important in systems biology? Well um, one reason is the complexity of cell-to-cell -cell interactions that occur in vivo. Uh, now I have a particular example I like to cite which is uh, something that happened some years ago at a conference. I saw a wonderful imaging study um, by a young guy at the University of Pittsburgh. He had profiled specific proteins on cancer cell lines and used them to prime immune cells in the pursuit of um, immunotherapy um, so that they could uh, attack the cancer and, and with cells in vitro um, he started with a macrophage and a tumor cell. Um, he could get that to ingest the tumor cell effectively, but by adding other immune cells not physically close to the tumor cell or believed to be involved, um, and that changed the macrophage's behavior completely um, such that it, it ignored the cancer cell. A further cellular addition reactivated the macrophage's appetite, um, but somehow made it spit it out again, so it, it turned the uh, um, the macrophage into its friend. So trying to translate these data to an in vivo situation um, really presents baffling complexity and that's not probably surprising to any of you but um, in vivo microscopy has enabled observations to be made in a, in a, a, a system of full complexity that's impossible to replicate in vitro. In vitro investigations uh, and, and in the use of models, uh, you know, they're, they're essential tools to uncover very specific pieces of knowledge. But how many times have you gained an understanding from an in vitro model that simply didn't translate in, in vivo? 
Um, and in vivo microscopy is one of many tools that aim to um, you know, inform this discrepancy. So um, further, there is evidence um, of, of these translational obstacles uh, in the, ri uh, the, the rise in phase for FDA withdrawals of approved pharmaceuticals and, and therapies. Um, you know, and I personally believe in the, in the post-genomic era, high throughput techniques um, that allow mass screening of vast pipelines of lead compounds with well-established chemistry and molecular specificity, um, however, do not, uh, do not really address the complexities of um, the, the many interactions in vivo. Um, now, of course, many other imaging techniques are helping to, uh, to paint a clearer systems biologic picture in this regard, but uh, it's important uh, um, to recognise that this is also combined with advances, not just in, in imaging, but also uh, in, in, in the development of fluorescent markers, um, and microscopy combined with that uh, can, can certainly um, prevent dead ends in research and development that may otherwise uh, emerge very late in the, in the development and uh, research process. Um, to highlight the challenges uh, in, in understanding uh, the role of in vivo microscopy, um, just please indulge me in a simple sporting analogy. So here's a picture of a, a, f a football player. Um, what is really going on here? Who's involved? Where are the other players? The field of view is, um, well, relative to the game, microscopic. Now, if we expand the view, we know a bit more about the context. There's many more cells, sorry, I mean uh, players, um, that are involved there seem to be two or three phenotypes based on identifiable features, but also many subtle ones. Um, it's still just a moment in time though, despite the larger view, um, and it has no temporal context. Is, is the jumping player about to head the ball, or has he just done that? Uh, is he offence or defence? Uh, what will be the response from the surrounding players, and how will they influence the outcome of the play, let alone uh, their future adaptations to change the course of the game. So these are simple questions under a well-defined rule book compared to uh, the prediction of therapeutic effect in a, a whole tumour or animal model of, of, of other diseases. Um, in systems biology, excuse me, um, in systems biology we don't even know many of the rules and tumour cells are, you know, manipulative cheats they don't even follow the rules that are understood most of the time. So how does in vivo microscopy shed light on uh, these kind of unknowns and what are some of the key technologies? The key forms of in vivo microscopy I, I will include today are all fluorescence imaging techniques. They are also optical sectioning techniques based on laser scanning. Um, and fundamentally, this overcomes the depth of field problems that typically require very thin specimens, um, and by thin I mean in the order of the depth of field of the microscope system itself. Um, and you know that that's often only possible in vitro. So I'll use the examples of confocal microscopy, nonlinear microscopy, including multi-photon with the mention for second harmonic generation, uh, and also recent developments enabling high performance confocal microscopes that are miniaturised to endoscopic performance at proportions. Um, now I'll explain these technologies um, in much more detail, but as a framework, um, each has a unique set of capabilities and limitations. So I'll start with um, a, a summary. And benchtop confocal, for example, has been around for decades. Um, it's a very mature technology. It, it's, it has the ability to image unsectioned tissue, in, including um, um, in, in the whole animal. Um, 
and, and can give you a view from about 100 to maybe 300 microns depth, um, but that's tissue dependent. Um, the limitations, however, are that it, it is quite cumbersome, so if you want to look at whole animal t preparations, um, it has to be oriented to suit the optical access of the, the microscope. Um, they're substantial in cost, but uh, they're, they're generally widespread in, in acceptance of that. Um, and generally, being a mature technology, they're pretty pretty easy to use and um, um, and user friendly. Now, multi-photon microscopy unlocks a, a lot of very special capabilities, including deeper tissue imaging, um, up to nearly a millimeter in some tissues. There's lots of flexibility in configuration, laser sources, uh, detection techniques, and, and so forth. Um, but they are a class four laser product, and they require um, a major installation. Um, and for in vivo imaging, it generally has to be performed in a, a laser tight interlocked chamber, which um, which can be uh, difficult. Um, they're expensive, but uh, that is mainly to do with uh, the laser technology and um, the complexity is high so it, it, they normally require a dedicated facility and a, a technician operator. Um, second harmonic generation, not much to say about that, it's really just an extension. Um, it, it does have the same sort of deep imaging of, uh, of, of, of capability as multi-photon uh, and Unlabeled collagen is uh, one of the, the, the highlights of, of SHG. So, the, and then the uh, one of the more recent developments is uh, miniaturized confocal microscopy, which has similar capabilities to benchtop confocal, um, but introduces the flexibility to have very small imaging probes that uh, can really view the tissue from any angle um, relative to the animal. So that's um, a, a particular um, capability that uh, complements the, uh, the other systems used in in vivo microscopy today and extends the reach of in vivo microscopy. Um, the miniaturization does result in a highly integrated system, however, um, which tend not to have as many um, options and configuration um, opportunities. Um, cost is comparable to uh, benchtop confocal, um, but the systems are very um, user friendly and, and could be learned very quickly by pretty much uh, anyone that works with whole animals. Um, so I'll, I'll now go through um, just just some of the basics, and I, I assume this is is pretty familiar to everyone. Um, but it's just important to recap uh, the basic principles of, of fluorescence to understand the differences between the technology. So just uh, in terms of the fluorescence um, excitation itself, um, it typically involves illumination of a very specific colour or wavelength um, focused into a specimen and some of that light um, is compatible with the, 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 the chemistry of, of fluorescent molecules in the tissue um, and that energy is absorbed and, and one photon excites an electron uh, to a higher energy state and as that returns to ground state uh, some energy is lost and a lower energy photon is emitted which is a longer wavelength. So for example blue illumination might result in green or red emission um, depending on the fluorophore of course or the fluorophore may not absorb blue light at all and would be excited by a, a different colour. Um, and single photon excitation is, is the sort of um, most common uh, method in confocal microscopy and this is a technique that basically involves um, a trick of geometric optics and it's basically involves focusing a laser um, to a point in a specimen as a, a tight focus and that becomes a diffraction limited spot. Um, fluorescence emitted from the focal plane 
by reciprocity will follow the same optical path back. Um, and that could be plucked off with a beam splitter passed through an aperture uh, to a detector. And the, the basic principle, therefore, is that, uh, is that you can efficiently collect fluorescence uh, from the focal point. But fluorescence from other planes uh, follows a different optical path and a negligible amount of light <clears throat> passes through the aperture um, and therefore it's rejected from detection. So, um, so that is uh, effectively a system whereby the detector only sees through its pinhole the focal point of the illumination. Now, of course, all of that just takes a fluorescence measurement from one point. Uh, to build up an image, an, an optical section, uh, requires scanning, which is not shown here. Um, but the important principle is that blur and flare from out-of-focus planes is rejected. Um, and, and that results in an optical section where most of the signal is from the focal plane. And then that focal plane can be moved relative uh, in depth relative to the, the surface of the tissue, and that um, enables uh, building up of 3D data um, and volumetric sampling. So, um, bear in mind that this is specifically confocal microscopy, um, and this capability is very important because in um, wide field microscopy or con conventional you know, fluorescence microscopy, um, the, the, the camera or the eyepiece receives all of the out-of-focus information at the same time, which generally swamps the signal from the focal plane. And that's the main, main reason why traditionally um, conventional microscopes aren't, you know, terribly useful in, in vivo except for particularly thin preparations. Um, now, this is an example of optical sectioning through a, 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 a whole mount of, of visceral adipose tissue. Um, and you can see as this plays through, depending on the uh, quality of your, your internet connection and um, I, I hope you're all uh, seeing this as, as well as I am, but um, basically this is just playing through optical sections across about 200 microns of tissue um, through this whole mount. And of course that can then be ported into software like uh, Amaris or, or other, other tools to observe the relationship of, uh, of the structures in the various planes. Um, and again, um, um, I, 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 I trust you get a reasonable view of this, but uh, um, uh, it, it, it may be compromised uh, depending on your um, connection bandwidth to this webinar. Now, for multi-photon excitation of fluorescence is quite different. Um, Rather than a continuous wave laser source, a high-powered ultra-fast pulse laser um, delivers incredibly short pulses, um, but very high-powered pulses. So um, these pulses are typically something in the order of 100 femtoseconds in, in duration and are repeated at 100 megahertz. So in other words, um, the pulses are only illuminating about one millionth of the time. but they are so powerful that as the beam comes to a focus, it becomes probable that two photons will arrive at about the same time um, at the same molecule. And this, um, this means that their energy can be co combined for a different form of excitation. Uh, it typically uses longer wavelengths in the near infrared to excite molecules that would need short wavelength excitation in a single photon mode. Uh, the two lower energy photons move an electron to a higher energy state via a transient and very short-lived um, intermediate uh, state. Um, but 
it's got the energy of two photons, and so uh, when that does settle back to to ground state, um, it emits a, a single higher energy photon um, than the excitation photons, or in other words, a shorter wavelength. So this is the opposite spectral shift direction compared to single photon excitation. Um, so in summary, single photon excitation, you have a, a, a short wavelength in and a longer wavelength out, and with multi-photon it's a longer wavelength in and uh, a shorter wavelength out. Um, much like on focal, um, uh, the, the general optical configuration is very similar. Um, however, unlike single photon, there's no requirement for the pinhole because the excitation only occurs in the focus of the beam where the photon flux um, results in the probability of, um, of, of, of dual photon excitation. So um, this means that the detector can be placed pretty much anywhere. So um, this diagram is very similar to the other one, but notice there's no pinhole. If there is light, um, all of the light that's excited can reach the detector. The detector could be placed under the sample, beside the sample, above the sample, um, back here. Um, and so there's a lot of flexibility in the options um, and, and that's very important. So um, the, the main advantages of this are that the longer wavelength excitation um, has less scattering through the tissue so that uh, the, the excitation can occur deeper um, than in uh, shorter wavelength single photon excitation. And just as important is the fact that uh, it doesn't really matter if the light's scattered on the way out because um, really the, the source is assured by the fact that it's, um, the fluorescence is only excited in the, the focal point. Um, and this means that you can just collect the light without a pinhole um, pretty much anywhere that emerges. Um, um, this is a typical um, uh, multi-photon type instrument configuration with a with a, a, a light tight animal enclosure. Um, in this case, from Carl Zeiss, but uh, there are offerings from all of the the major microscope companies. Um, but that just gives you idea an idea of the size of the uh, the instrument. But a real installation in a lab looks more like this um, with all of the lasers and um, wavelength mixing and so forth um, to provide a, a fully flexible um, setup. Um, and this is a, a, an animal chamber associated with, uh, with that. Um, and this is a nice example of the capabilities. Um, now, although this is not an in vivo image, it's a, it's a large 3D data set of optical sections through the entire thickness of an 800 micron um, thick brain hole mount, and so it really shows the uh, the, the the depth of, of imaging and the resolution that uh, that multiphoton brings to understand complex three-dimensional structures and networks. Um, so to recap so far, it's the optical sectioning capability of these microscope systems that fundamentally enables the in vivo application by eliminating the blur and flare that would occur if you were using wide field microscopy and whole tissues without sectioning them. Um, but it's important to note that uh, uh, we're not imaging the tissue itself, but the distribution of fluorophores, um, be they endogenous or, or more commonly exogenous. And there have been numerous advances in fluorophore development to partner with these instruments to reveal highly specific features. So these range from dyes, um, which for example, uh, whose pharmacokinetics result in a distribution that reveals um, basic morphological details, um, to protein-specific markers, 
transgenic an, uh, animal models um, that actually make their own dye, such as green fluorescent protein, when certain genes are expressed, and markers of physiological and pathological processes, such as calcium dyes that light up neurons uh, when they fire. So there are hundreds of markers available that are suitable for use in whole animals. Um, however, placing animals on the stage of a bench microscope can limit which tissue can be imaged um, due to the alignment and stabilisation issues. Um, so wouldn't it be good if we could take the microscope to the animal? Well, this is indeed doable with the development of miniature confocal microscopes. Now, these are enabled by fibre optics, um, although the systems fundamentally contain most of the same elements of lasers, detectors and a pinhole, in this case, uh, enacted by uh, single mode optical fibre. So the laser is launched into the fibre and focused um, to a focal plane, as, as with all of the laser scanning techniques. Um, fluorescence from the focal plane will be recaptured into the fibre by reciprocity uh, and can be delivered back to the, the, the box on the bench that contains the uh, spectral filtering and, and detection of the light. And as with any confocal microscope, um, it requires a scan mechanism um, to move that point around to create a, a, a 2D optical section. And in this case, um, this can be highly miniaturised um, so that uh, so that the, the 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 imaging head of the system um, is very small for uh, potentially even endoscopy. Um, there's also a Z actuator that's not shown here, and. The Z actuator enables movement of the focal plane relative to the surface of the tissue and um, therefore gives the uh, 3D uh, sampling and reconstruction possibilities even in a miniaturised endomicroscope. Um, now this is a version of that approach that's specifically designed for preclinical research. Um, this system uses a low power blue laser that's, uh, that's housed in the box here and, um, and various probes can be interchanged via um, a, 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 a connection um, and um, as you can see here the, these probes could be used handheld or, or mounted in a, a micro positioning stage um, uh, animal stage, if that's um, if that's appropriate for the uh, particular investigation. Um, the important thing is this probe doesn't have to be vertical. Um, it can really approach the tissue from any angle, um, and can also approach a whole organ systems um, via a very small incision, um, thusly enabling um, longitudinal experimental investigations. Um, so I'd like to walk you through some example applications um, that hopefully illustrate how in vivo microscopy enables um, unique observations. So this video, and, and, and again, um, I, uh, the video may play smoothly or be fragmented depending on um, the speed of your uh, your connection, but um, um, this is an image sequence captured in living gut plexus uh, using the fluorophore fluoro8, which increases in fluorescence with calcium flux. Um, so after adjusting the depth to find the active cells in the tissue, the images were collected as a continuous sequence in one plane. Um, the move is then generated in, uh, in Fiji or ImageJ, which is the free image processing um, analysis package uh, from the NIH um, and that was also used to, to pseudo colour the images to highlight the transitions from the um, um, inactive cells to the, the, uh, the actual cells that are firing. And this is across about half of one millimetre um, and it's a, it's a one megapixel image. 
<clears throat> um, another unique application um, for endomicroscopy um, relates to tissue engineering, and uh, in this example, we're talking about uh, cartilage, and this is a this is a really interesting example. So, um, this this image was generated after topical application of, of fluorescein, um, and the characteristic architecture of the matrix of lacune A, which contain the chondrocytes, can be clearly seen, and this zoomed up view gives you um, a good idea of the, the level of detail of the individual cells within the lacunae, and this is with a, a, a quite a non-specific dye. Um, so these images are, are from a, a study by Kirk et al. from Western Australia. Uh, the fluorophore now is acroflavin hydrochloride, which mostly stains nuclei, but also um, stains uh, collagen to an extent. Um, and this was applied topically uh, um, about one minute prior to commencement of imaging, and this study was in live sheep. Um, the protocol induced defects in the articular cartilage of, of sheep knee, which could be seen microscopically in the image shown at the left. Um, so, as you can see, we have the fairly normal distribution of uh, uh, chondrocyte nuclei here, and this area is completely devoid. <clears throat> also in this protocol, uh, tissue was harvested from the animal grown up um, uh, in, in culture uh, and formed with uh, collagen into a, a bioengineered putty to, uh, to implant in the, in the defect. And this enabled longitudinal study. So following up on this um, procedure of autologous chondrocyte implantation, uh, it's, it's, this image at the left is just for reference, that's normal collagen. Um, and this is at an early stage the graft site um, as the, 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 the chondrocytes grow and begin to um, to organise the collagen, and then over time, um, this actually becomes more complex, and uh, whilst uh, whilst chaotic, um, the structure is evolving, and in these experiments, did progress to um, organise hyaline cartilage. Um, now, this is a great application example because there's really no other way to do this. A, The, the really important take home message for this application is we're looking at tissue that cannot be biopsied because a biopsy would be more severe um, damage than the actual defect that is attempting to be repaired um, through this tissue engineering approach. Um, and so a miniaturised confocal microscope is, is really the only um, way to gain this microscopic information um, in vivo longitudinally um, in, in, in the course of this study. Um, and this example is molecular imaging in, um, in pancreas, uh, in, in, in the, um, and Apologies, the title says it's mouse liver, but it's actually pancreas. Um, the uh, image at the left shows just a, a low-level dye administered intravenously to provide the vascular framework. Um, and the right image is obtained about 60 minutes after application of a carboxyfluorosinated um, octreotate, which labels somatostatin receptors. Um, and in this tumour model, this is, this is very interesting because uh, the, um, the ability to do this um, in such a short time post-administration is, is quite important because 
um, as with many fluorescent markers that are targeting tumours, um, the dye hangs around for a long time in the liver. So this time frame of observation is difficult to achieve. Um, in, in things like whole body imaging, uh, which, which, for which you need to wait until the liver loading of, of the agent under investigation um, has cleared uh, to get a, a specific distribution um, in an organ like the pancreas, which is, is, is obviously uh, obscured by um, interference from liver fluorescence. So um, in the microscopic domain, of course, that doesn't matter. Um, and so this technique could be very useful for um, filling in those sort of time frames and overcoming macroscopic um, interference from neighbouring structures. Um, and also in the pancreas, uh, this is an example of um, the dynamics of uh, blood flow. Um, and it's really just an example of you know how cell movements can be tracked and observed um, in an intact organ um, that uh, would be very difficult to access via um, um, via a benchtop system and, and very difficult uh, in terms of surgical exposure uh, for, for placement in the animal stage of a of, of a, uh, a benchtop system. Um, this is a, a nice study of liver necrosis in, in vivo. Um, so one of the issues with this study was the, the very patchy nature, uh, nature of necrosis uh, instigated by common bile duct ligation. And uh, in the image at the left, you can see a site of necrosis with uh, um, inflammatory cells. And on the right, uh, the image was using uh, a, a fluorescinated um, large molecular weight dextran, and the, the, that keeps the uh, the dye in the sinusoids due to the large molecular weight, except at sites of necrosis, which are, are, are leaky. Um, so it's a nice example of um, direct observation of something that's very uh, that's very patchy, uh, but more importantly, it's done through a, a very small body wall incision, so um, this could be also done long, longitudinally. Um, this is a, a really interesting study um, that was uh, performed in, in Germany by, by Martin Goetz. Um, this, this image uh, was obtained in the liver, again through a small body wall incision, um, and he was able to um, stabilise this uh, with the small probe um, and image the same region for um, several hours, um, which is a, a remarkable capability um, with minimal surgical invasion. So um, apoptosis was induced um, in this protocol, resulting in um, the uh, um, permeabilization of these cells. Um, 15 to 30 minutes later, we see cytoplasmic uh, vesicles forming, followed by nuclear fragmentation, uh, and, and ultimately cell death. And the aftermath of that is uh, is the, uh, the, the the space left by the uh, the the dead cells? Um, and finally, I want to talk about um, uh, some surprising results uh, obtained in gut epithelium. For a very long time, uh, there's been a lot of investigation of, of how a single cell epithelium that can uh, that that is responsible for the barrier function, i.e., between everything in the digestive tract and the circulation, um, can be maintained by a single-celled epithelium that replaces itself every five to seven days 
in entirety. Um, and there's been a lot of study of this in, in vitro and uh, um, some in vivo, but um, endomicro confocal endomicroscopy really opened up this issue and the surprising result was that uh, you can see the whole process and if you look at the small bowel, um, you don't have to look very hard, you will see ejecting epithelial cells on a, on a very regular basis. So um, you can also see the process of uh, mitosis as shown here um, and a good view of, of, of uh, the order of the, uh, of, of the brush border and, and, and mucus layer in a, in a healthy um, healthy epithelium. Um, and the really surprising part was this is happening all the time and it only takes a couple of minutes um, and there's a process that you can track over time. This is the process of ejection here and the important part is the, the neighbouring epithelial cells have zipped up behind the ejected cells and, um, and, 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 and that maintains the barrier function. This is another view of that process as, as this region repairs and here another example of neighbouring epithelium so epithelial cells uh, zipping up to maintain the barrier function um, with virtually no compromise to the, to the mucus layer. Um, and so all this is observable in vivo and uh, really has spawned a new field of research actually into um, ways of observing this barrier function. This process is dramatically altered in inflammatory bowel disease, um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease um, and um, you can also see in these images and, and this is in healthy ileum um, the number of cells that are routinely ejected. So this is happening all the time um, and permeability studies have been performed um, but this has answered long-standing questions about uh, how this process works dynamically um, and very difficult to replicate this in, in vitro. So um, to revisit our introductory summary, I hope the roles um, and the uh, advantages and limitations of the review technologies was, uh, was useful. Uh, these technologies form part of a, a larger arsenal of weapons against the unknown of, of biologic systems, um, but I truly believe that the technologies for microscope, um, microscopy in vivo can complement other technologies and answer uh, previously impossible questions and uh, I think that's uh, particularly exciting. So finally, um, just to summarise, with these tremendous advances in technology both in the fluorophores, the animal models, the imaging systems, um, there are an unprecedented range of options for microscopic interrogation of biological systems. Um, in vivo microscopy plays an important role in the observation and measurement of cellular events in complex systems that can't be recreated in vitro um, and that fills an important and fundamental uh, gap in, in, in knowledge um, obtained via many other methods. So the ability to obtain virtual biopsies longitudinally also can streamline investigations and reduce late surprises in, uh, in research protocols. And um, further, the unexpected nature of some of the findings such as the op uh, observation of the mechanism and time course of epithelial cell turnover in the GI tract um, has created new lines of, of relevant in vivo research um, after decades of speculation. And the first one I'd like you to cover is um, a question that came in prior to the event and that is um, you mentioned the use of scanning fiber technology and we're hoping that you could do a review for the audience of how this compares to bundle fiber and so what we have done is prepared just a quick uh, slide to maybe help guide you through this answer um, uh, which the audience should see just in a moment but can go ahead and I'll bring that up uh, yeah. Yeah, look, I, I, I can start to answer that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
bundled fiber um, is an approach that, that doesn't scan the fiber. It um, has a densely um, um, populated bundle of fibers um, and that has has certain value in some applications but there, there are several limitations. So the main one being resolution um, versus field of view. Now the, the, the a bundle of fibres, for, for, for optical fibres to guide light they have to have a core and a cladding and when they're used as a confocal pinhole that core um, is a lot smaller than the total diameter of the the uh, um, the, the the core and cladding, and so necessarily there's there's information missing if you project that into a specimen. Um, there's also a, a physical size limitation in the sense that um, the the bundled fibre probes, you know, the, the the biggest ones have something like thirty thousand fibres in the bundle, so that's a maximum information content of about 0 0.03 megapixels compared to continuous scanning which doesn't have any gaps and you can fully sample the optical domain um, and uh, over a large field of view can achieve submicron resolution um, and, and generate you know two, two megapixel images for example um, and so that's that um, is, is a severe limitation, and um, so the the only way to get truly cellular level resolution with a bundle is to have a very small field of view, um, and it, so um, different probes for different fields of view. But if you have a large field of view, um, such as half a millimeter, then you you don't have cellular resolution. If you want cellular resolution, you you can only get something in the, in the order of uh, um, a, a very small fraction of that. So um, that's that's the main difference, and that's um, um, really why I didn't in, include that in the in the in the presentation. No, that's a, that's a great answer. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Okay, so uh, next, um, could you comment where does whole body fluorescence imaging fit into the mix? Uh, you didn't have a chance to cover that today. <clears throat> no, I, I, t I touched on it in the example of um, uh, uh, the, the molecular labeling in the pancreas that in whole body imaging would have been obscured by um, the accumulation of dye in the liver. Um, in the time frame of that experiment, so um, whole body imaging is a, a you know a very um, powerful technique for localizing um, accumulation of, of, of fluorescence in in hot spots or or very particular parts of um, um, of the body, uh, but it's um, it's it, it's limited to very small animals, and it's uh, certainly um, not microscopic, and uh, there needs to be a clear separation um, structurally um, between the um, accumulation of fluorescence in the target um, tumor or organ system um, or region um, versus um, other non-specific accumulations of, of, of fluorophore. Perfect. Um, Let's turn our attention back to 3D uh, image generation. Could you just quickly uh, or clarify and elaborate how this is, how this process is achieved uh, using a confocal uh, endomicroscopy system, such as the view in, view in vivo system? Um, yeah, well, the, the, the control of the z-axis is, is pretty important in terms of adjusting imaging depth because um, the, the the fundamental enabling feature of, um, of, of for, for in vivo microscopy is optical sectioning unless you have a very thin specimen. So um, the, if, if you don't have the control of, of depth, there's two things you can't do. One is find the optimal plane 
um, for a, a for a non three dimensional investigation, just just trying to find the relevant tissue um, or the relevant cells, um, such as the example with calcium imaging earlier, where the the activity was in a um, a planar plexus um, that, mm -hmm. uh, that that needed to be um, identified and singled out. Um, but of course, the 3D aspect also introduces the concept of a, a virtual biopsy. So you're, you're effectively sampling a volume of tissue, much like um, taking up taking out a volume of tissue with a real biopsy and uh, and sectioning it. So um, the three-dimensional aspects very important. The other thing that it, it, it compensates for is is tissue surface um, topography. So you know, if you have a fixed focal plane depth. Um, you, you really will see dramatic changes in um, uh, the image simply based on moving from one region to another rather than the fact that the tissue is actually different. So um, it's, it's, it's very important to be able to move through the layers to create that micro anatomical context um, for the images that, uh, that you're producing. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um... Can you comment, um, you mentioned in the schematic uh, for uh, the operation of the system um, that uh, blue, blue wavelength 488 nanometers excitation is used um, um, and not the near infra infrared range. Can you clarify as to the rationale here and requirements? Um, yeah, the, the, the rationale for that selection for the, for the current systems um, is basically based on the, the number of options for fluorescence. So um, right now, if you look across the gamut of um, molecular labels, pH indicators, calcium indicators, um, live dead markers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, the, the, the fluorophores are available for multiple wavelengths, but um, the largest number still centres on the um, Good old fluorescein filter set, and so this is, um, um, you know, that that that's the reason for that. Um, that um, now certainly there's other dyes you could image at other wavelengths, and certainly there's um, quite a, a, the, 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 there's a lot of development going on for uh, for dyes that are um, in the infrared region, um, but at the moment. That, that that doesn't offer the same um, versatility in terms of the just the, the number of protocols you could achieve um, mm -hmm. as blue, but it, it's going to be more relevant in in in, in the future increasingly. Okay. Um... As an add-on, is there any safety issues having class four lasers on the end of an optical fiber? Uh, yeah. Well. Well. The. Um, the view in vivo doesn't have class four laser. It's it's it's, it's a um, it's it's safe for use, and that's very important um, for having a probe that you know you're going to orient in in all sorts of uh, directions. Mm -hmm. um, multi photon and, and second harmonic generation and and you know other forms of nonlinear microscopy are dependent on class four lasers, um, and those. Um, uh, can blind you or, or, or burn a hole in you pretty quickly if, if um, not controlled carefully. So um, the the issue with um, with with multi photon and, and probes, yes, if you're going to um, produce, and in fact we have um, we have successfully uh, demonstrated prototypes multi photon microscopes in our in the form factor of our Scanner, mm -hmm. um, so it's possible, but it's 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 uh, it is a real problem to to be waving that around the room, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and and so you know, and, and that's why the the, the bench top rigs um, have you know light tight boxes, or at least um, at, for the wavelength um, involved. Sometimes they're transparent, but they block infrared. Um, but you know the animal chambers um, are, are very important, and they they have interlocks for all of everything that opens and shuts, so that if you have to access the animal, it will 
will kill the laser. Um, so it's 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 a manageable manageable issue, but they are um, they mm -hmm. are you know they do require significant management. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, well, thank you for that uh, <clears throat> for that, Peter. Just gonna get a couple more questions in here and wrap up. Um, could you comment on the actual working distance of the optics or the depth of imaging? Uh, how Martin has asked, can you really image deep from the surface of the optics? Um, um, yeah, look, the 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 view in vivo really largely follows the same rules as as, as confocal microscopy, mm -hmm. um, and it's very tissue dependent. So, for example, in the cornea, um, which for example is the the the, the image um, uh, the image that you use in your audience poll slide. Um, you can pretty much use the full working distance of the optics, which is about 350 microns. Um, but in other tissues that are highly scattering, like the, the stomach mucosa, um, it, it's more like 100 microns. Mm -hmm. So, you know, very much, uh, very much tissue dependent. Okay. Um, and maybe just final, um, can, can you work with more than one color? Um, uh, in a particular protocol, um, fluorescent dye, I'm assuming, is the suggestion here. Yeah, the the, the present um, the the level of integration to achieve the miniaturization does limit um, some some aspects of that flexibility. However, we pretty much cover the whole visible spectrum. So, with one fluorescent wavelength, um, uh, sorry, one one excitation wavelength. Um, the, the the instrument has you know eight filters typically, um, and you can carve out narrow parts of the the spectrum. So, for example, um, something like photoporphyrin nine um, will emit mostly red, even with blue excitation, um, and that can be imaged beside um, something with a, a more typical green fluorescence. Um, so it is possible to um, perform multispectral imaging with the system on the detection side, but uh, it's at a fixed excitation at the moment.